Good evening, everyone. I like an audience that responds like that. That's nice. Um, a couple of notes for everyone, um, in case you aren't familiar. Uh, our restrooms are out of the auditorium and around the corner. Um, and you can pass by the lovely artwork by uh, Mr. Tyrone Jeter um, as you go there. <laughs> Um, uh, one note, if you, after tonight is over um, and you depart the library, uh, please note they will lock the gates as all of the, as we close everything off, they will lock the gates in the parking lot. So if you happen to want to go off and go party somewhere, don't leave your car in that lot or you will not be able to get it till tomorrow morning. <laughs> so take your car with you first. Um, so, welcome to Richland Library. Um, thank you all so much for being here tonight as we celebrate our broader bookshelf challenge with two amazing authors, Walter Mosley and Nikki Finney. Um, each year, um, and by the way, I am Lee Snellgrove. I'm the arts and culture manager here at Richland Library. So it's nice to be here with you all tonight. Each year, our broader bookshelf challenge encourages readers in Richland County to expand their horizons by choosing books outside their usual reading comfort zones. With prompts like reading a coming of age tale or a pre-1900 historical fiction novel or a mystery thriller novel like much of Mr. Mosley's work. Um, if you complete this challenge, I will bring your attention to these lovely bags on stage. Uh, they are the completion prize now. So if you read uh, books that meet all 14 prompts in a single year, then you too can go home with a lovely Broader Bookshelf bag. Through the Broader Bookshelf initiative, we've been able to host an incredible array of authors, including Leonard Pitts Jr., Min Jin Lee, Jenny Lawson, and Stephen Graham Jones. And we are thrilled to have Mr. Walter Mosley here with us tonight. Walter Mosley is one of the most vers versatile and admired writers in America today with more than 60 critically acclaimed books that cover a wide range of ideas, genres, and forms. He has introduced an indelible cast of characters into the American canon, starting with his first novel, Devil in a Blue Dress, which brought Easy Rollins, his private detective in post-war LA, and his friends Jackson Blue and Raymond Mouse Alexander into readers' lives. Concerned by the lack of diversity in all levels of publishing, Mr. Mosley established the Publishing Certificate Program with the City University of New York to bring together book professionals and students hailing from a wide range of racial, ethnic, and economic communities for courses, internships, and job opportunities. In 2013, Mr. Mosley was inducted into the New York State Writers Hall of Fame, and he is the winner of numerous awards, including an O. Henry Award, the Mystery Writers of America's Grand Master Award, a Grammy, several NAACP Image Awards, and PEN America's Lifetime Achievement Award. In 2020, he was named the recipient of the Robert Kirsch Award for Lifetime Achievement from the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books, and was honored with a medal for distinguished contribution to American letters by the National Book Foundation. Tonight, Mr. Mosley will be joined in conversation by renowned poet and professor Nikki Finney, who has spent her career illuminating the Southern cultural and political heritage of black people in ways that resonate throughout the country and the world. Her work has garnered awards, including the Pan American Open Book Award, the Benjamin Franklin Award for Poetry, the Wallace Stevens Award, given annually by the Academy of American Poets to, the, to recognize the outstanding and proven mastery in the art of poetry, and most famously, the National Book Award for Poetry for her 2011 book, Head Off and Split. At the University of South Carolina, Ms. Finney holds the John H. Bennett Jr. Chair in Creative Writing and Southern Literature, as well as a, distinguished, a Carolina Distinguished Professorship. She has recently been appointed the executive director of the newly launched Ernest A. Finney Jr. Cultural Arts Center in Columbia, a 21st century arts and cultural center named for her father, an exciting endeavor deeply planted in the twin soul soils of creativity and black cultural expression. It is such an honor. And with that, it's such an honor to welcome Walter Mosley and Nikki Finney with us here tonight. Thank you all.
just touch, touch. One, two, three. Hello, everybody. Hello. How are you? Yes. We can sort of see you. <laughs> I want to read a little bit of something so that I don't forget what I want to say because um, it's all very important. So bear with me, okay? Walter Mosley, welcome. A warm welcome to Columbia, South Carolina. So many people have been messaging me today that are incredibly excited to see and, and hear you. And we greatly thank the Richland County Library for always being a bellwether for just the right books and the authors and our, that our community needs to be engaging with. Today, here's a secret. Walter went to Railroad Barbecue for lunch. <laughs> And he was gracious enough to walk to the Ernest A. Finney Jr. Cultural Arts Center directly behind the building for just a moment. I kidnapped him for that. And when I walked back, when I walked Walter back to the restaurant, I was leaving out in front. And the, there was this woman who was running towards me out of breath. And she said, was that Walter Mosley <laughs> you were walking with? I really wanted to lie. I wanted to say, no, 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 no. But I didn't. I said, uh, yes. And she said, I knew it. Push me down. No, push, pushed her way. No. <laughs> Made her way into the restaurant. I do know, I do not know what happened after that, but maybe Walter will fill us in. But, uh, I could have swore the car, uh, the car was still running in the parking lot when she got out. It was it was this beautiful moment where a reader recognizes somebody they love and somebody they cherish, and they're like in their hometown, and they want more, right? And so it was just very very sweet, very sweet. Before we dive into uh, Walter's work, I want to um, thank him personally. Uh, for something that I always try and thank him for. And I've only had the opportunity once, one time before to do this. But it's something that I really have to do because it stamped my life and career so profoundly. And um, I can't forget this moment. Um, I don't want to. And it's also a part, and we'll talk a, a little bit about this more, uh, of Walter's legacy uh, in this world. It was 1998, I was invited to New York City to read my poetry for the first time. It was a very big deal for this South Carolina girl to get this invitation. I purchased a new linen suit that I didn't have the money for, and my tall aristocratic New Jersey aunts who had never heard me read poetry before caught the train from Vauxhall and East Orange and were already sitting in the audience when I got there. And I walked, when I walked on stage to read, I looked up and I saw a very familiar face, one that I had never met but knew from his 25 books at the time. And I remember thinking to myself as I went from point to point, what in the world is Walter Mosley doing at my reading? <laughs> and what I later found out after the reading and then over those 25 years was that Walter Mosley had come to support this new black poet who was just getting out into the world. And it was 25 years ago when that happened. And then just a couple of weeks ago, I was reading at the Schomburg as sort of the, the old head on the, on, the, on the poet list. And Walter was in the audience again, front row. So this was not a one-time thing only um, we our, our, we have shared 25 years of friendship and keeping in touch with each other, but a part of Walter's legacy that really, really matters to me deeply and matters to all that he has, all those others that he has touched has to do with how much he cares about the, the poets and the writers coming behind him. As you can see from his shirt that says Cave Canem, which is the illustrious, amazing, and wonderful um, place for black poets in America. So I thank you. Okay. You're welcome. And thank you. Do you remember that? You remember that moment? Oh, listen, I, I, you, I, I remember it's so great because it's never the same. What I remember, what I remember was I, I was at a, a, a reading 
you know, it was a, you know, it was poetry. It's in New York. I was a member of the the um, the Poetry Society of America at that time. Uh, we had a fight later on, but um, and 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 then I, I saw you know a lot of poets, but I saw Nikki. I was like, I really, I saw Nikki, and I was like, oh my god. But, wow, you know, and it just kept going on. I remember uh, one of the poems about a cowboy and a car. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I was like, it was so cool. It was, like, so great. I went, oh, my God. This is, like, this is a real poet, you know, because they're real poets. And there are other people, you know, who are really good. They're, they write and they're, you know, <laughs> they put things out there and they know how to make a sonnet, you know, work and stuff, you know. But, but so, and then I went back to Poetry Society. It happened, like, a few weeks later. They, they said to me, they said, um... Uh, each person, we, we, you know, we're doing readings in New York, and each person has to choose a, 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 a poet that they want to, you know, support. And 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 people had, you know, people, yeah, you know, listen, these are people in New York, and they were talking about their friends, you know, and their friends are very good poets, by the way. It's not a, like a bad thing. But I said, well, I know some. I met somebody named Nikki Finney, and I want her to come. And they said, well, where did, where does she she live? And you know, and I I forget. You know, I said somewhere. I, I don't know what <laughs> what town I said. You know, but they said, well, what borough was that in? <laughs> and I said, it's in it, 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 it's Kentucky. it's in Kentucky. Yeah, <laughs> it's in Kentucky because that's yeah you were in Kentucky then, and then. Um, they said, "Oh, I don't, I don't know if we can do that." And I said, and I asked them. I remember asking them. I said, "So is this the Poetry Society of America, <laughs> or is it the Poetry Society of Manhattan?" You know. And then you know, and they brought Nick, and it was great. I mean, it was fantastic. It was so beautiful. You know, all the people were there. Mary Baraka was there, and Quin uh, Quincy Troop was there, and you know, the you know, the 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 other people who matter. You know. And, uh, you know, and it's just, and it's just wonderful, but it's always been true, you know, because I mean, listen, you know, a lot of times people come up to you, you know, and when you're black in America, people say, well, I'm an elder, you know, people say that, you know, and, and you have to say to them, no, you're just old. <laughs> you're an old person. And, but you know, you have to do other things to be an, an elder. You know, so a lot of people say I'm a poet, you know, and you know, I never argue with them, but, but you know, Nikki Finney is a great poet. She's a great poet. She's a voice of America and of the world. And 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 that's and that's that's what's you know it's always been true, you know, for me. I mean, I've known I know a lot of other people, you know, who come I remember when 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 I, I had the big struggle with the National Book Awards and I, I got them to give the lifetime achievement to Gwendolyn Brooks, you know. I mean, listen, Gwendolyn Brooks, I mean, what what are you gonna say? You know. And, you know, but, you know, I, I, I see Nikki in the same way. I see her work in the same way. I think that, you know, that we have people who make a difference. They make a difference, you know, in the world. And it's very important for us, you know, I think to understand what greatness is, you know, because you love everybody. But that doesn't make everybody great. You just love them all, you know. <laughs> but in, in all of that, Access. You pro you provided access to things, mm. and I think that's the thing that you continue to do for for so many black poets and black writers. Yeah. I think that you. I think I think that you know that. Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of like how you see yourself not bulldozing a path, but creating one? Well, I think it, you know it's the same thing that everybody else does. I mean, you know, and 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 it's a hard thing because you know, you know, if you're black in America, uh, any time in the last four hundred years, uh, you know, it it's hard enough to get enough food to feed your own children. You know, I mean, it, it's like, and, and somebody said, "Well, what do you think? What do you think about Mr. Jones?" I, said, I don't know, think nothing about Mr. Jones. Now, uh, give me some oatmeal for my child here. I was I was thinking the other day. It was a story. Uh, uh, Paul Coates. Was, Paul said to say hello. By the way, uh, uh, Paul. Uh, uh, you know, was at, you know, talking to me about boxers. We, I was talking in you know, in Baltimore uh, at the Enoch Pratt Library, and and I was telling the story. There was a there was a boxer who, whose name I've forgotten. It's it's too bad, but he was a it was a lot of great boxers, uh, heavyweight boxers in Ali's time. And this one guy, he he he'd been in prison, you know, for murder. He got out of prison. He 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 made himself into a boxer. He's a really good boxer, but his wife left him. He had his son. He's trying to take care of his son, but he didn't have the money to 
feed his son, you know, so he went to his father and he said, Dad, listen, I can't feed my son. Can you help me? So, well, son, I, I can't help you because if I help you now, you're never going to stand on your own. You know, but my son is starving, Dad. And he said, I'm, I'm sorry. I just have to do the right thing. And then the next day, Muhammad Ali calls the guy and he said, listen, I got this fight set up. The other guy fell out. Uh, they're paying us two million. We split it. Uh, you want to fight? <laughs> and, and all of this was the guy that asked him a question. They said, well, well uh, everybody says Ali is the greatest. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And he told that story. Because mm -hmm. that's, you know, what makes you great isn't being a better boxer than somebody else or a better poet for that matter. Mm -hmm. what, what, what does it is, is when you, you just say, well, part of my life is, is sharing with the, with, with the people that I love mm -hmm. and, the, and the people who are deserving yeah. in this world, you know. Hey, I want to, um, I love the story of your mother and your father yeah. because one, it made you, two, I feel like it's a poem or maybe it's a love series. I don't know, but I just want to share this with the audience and have you comment on it. Your mom was a Jewish socialist. Your father was a black janitor from Louisiana. Yes, from, from Louisiana, from uh, from uh, New Iberia. So they were from different sides of the track in Los Angeles. Yeah. Yes? Their meeting and ultimately the making of you is such an amazing love story. I don't know the details, but I'm just, that, just that alone is enough. It reminds me a great deal of the story of Mildred Jeter, a black woman, and Richard Loving, mm. a white man, who wanted to get married <laughs> in 1958 in Virginia, Loving versus Virginia. That landmark case, mm -hmm. because of what they called the, don't laugh, the Racial Integrity Act of 1928. <laughs> That's another story. Um, but I heard you say once that my parents gave me a lot. And I wanted you to just linger there a minute because you are giving us a lot in so many different genres, in so many different ways with your life. How do those two worlds touch? <laughs> okay, uh, I'll try to answer that question. I, I, I mean, there's a couple of funny parts of it. Uh, first, you know, my, my mother was a socialist and she was married to a guy named Novak, you know, and Novak was very rich. It's a, a private street in downtown LA, still there. And you know, this is where all these mansions of the really rich were. My mother, he had a house there. My mother lived with him, but she's a socialist. So she got a job as a clerk uh, you know, in, in the uh, city school system. Uh, and, you know, my father w was was a, a janitor in that same place. Uh, he'd be upset if I said that. He was a custodian in the same place. <laughs> and and, um, and and so I asked my mom about it one day. She said, well, you know, I met your father uh, at the thing. And she didn't, you know, fill in what m met mean, meant. But... <laughs> And then she said, I realized, you know, that I didn't love uh, the man I was married to. So I went home and I told him, I said, I'm sorry, but I, I'm leaving you. I'm going to go live with this dude down in Watts, you know. Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was very funny. Uh, my, my parents had, had that, that there's a kind of a strength to them, which was uh, unconscious. They didn't, they didn't think about it a lot. My, my father, on the other hand, my father, um, his mother died when he was seven. His father uh, went to work, you know, logging, never came back, probably died when he was eight. Mm -hmm. My father was on his own since the age of eight. Uh, he jumped a, a, a train in, uh, in, in, in Louisiana and came to uh, Houston where he walked around Fifth Ward mm -hmm. until he finally found his mother's father. Mm -hmm. He introduced himself, and he, and he said, well, I don't know why you're coming here. He said, well, if you want, you can sleep on the porch, but I'm not going to feed you. you know. And my father made it from there. The thing about that, the thing about that, that abject uh, poverty that my father experienced, in, in a way, helped him. Because, you know, sometimes, a lot of times when you're with family, we, you, you share things with each other. You share, you know, food, but you also share poverty and your concept mm -hmm. of poverty mm -hmm. and uh and it somehow becomes okay mm -hmm. it was never okay with my father I, was like, Shit, I might die any minute so I gotta you know I gotta push and so I think that that he his 
he 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 had a much broader sense of the world and was able to do a lot more. And, and of course, you know, they, he, they, you know, both of them, you know, helped everybody, you know, and it, and it was wonderful. And, and, but you know, part of it is just consciousness. You know, my mother's relatives were poor Jews from Latvia, Estonia, uh, uh, some from Russia. Uh, they lived in the same kind of place that black people lived in. They mm-hmm. lived in ghettos. They lived in shtetls. Uh, they couldn't vote. Uh, they couldn't, um, uh, you know, marry into any of the, the other families. They couldn't do anything. They lived in abject poverty. And every once in a while, people would run around and kill them. Mm-hmm. You know, hang them, burn them, all that stuff. And, you know, my father, he came from the same place. Mm-hmm. It was a, there was a wonderful connection mm-hmm. You know, and there's a there, and, and in that connection, that that sense of love, mm. um, you 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 just kind of learned. Well, you know, we're all together here. Mm. I mean, that doesn't exactly answer the question. I know, but 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 it it does in a way when you're talking about um, uh, what they did for people. Mm-hmm. You saw that generosity. I always say to people, be generous, be generous. No matter what you have, you can do something with it. And that sounds like what you come from. That's what I see you doing. What what I began talking about when I was introducing you. Um, and it's not only for deserving people. I, I remember the last time my father was sick. He was dying, but you know he was he was okay, but he was dying. And um, we, we had a relative, and the relatives you know was calling my father saying, "I need to come by and talk to you. I need to come by and talk to you." Because and, and finally one day. And my father was very upset. He said, oh, Ella, to my, to my mother, he's going to come. He's going to ask me for money. I know he's going to ask me for money. I know he's going to do it. Damn, I, I, yeah, I can't. And so finally she said, well, just say no, Roy. Just say no. And he said, oh, you're going to ask me for that money. And so he comes over. And, he, and you know, is that, you know, the story, oh, yeah, you know, my son got arrested and we got to get him out. And my wife got this, you know, this infection and we got to take care of that. And this other kid, I don't know what's wrong with him, but he's not doing it right. And, and he's going on and on and on. And my father said, oh, my God, you know, that sounds terrible. And he said, yeah, I said, so you, you, how do you be handling that? He said, well, you know, Roy, that's why I'm here. I need a little bit of money. <laughs> my father said, you do? What is it you need? And he goes, I need $1,000. And, you know, this is in the 70s. And my father said, oh, no, it's not to me. Like, you need $2,000. <laughs> And he said, you know, Roy, I think you're right. I didn't want to ask for it. <laughs> and my, my father turned to my mother and said, Ella, go, go get my checkbook. <laughs> so my mother's like, and she goes and gets a checkbook. And he, and he fills out the check. And he fills it out. And he gives them to him and he leaves. And my mother's mad. I said, what did you do? You say you don't want to give it to him. You blah, blah, blah. And, and, and my father said, and he was laughing. He's laughing. He said, I, I'm not going to hear from him again for another 10 years. <laughs> So in a way, it's that interesting thing. He wasn't being mean because he really did need some money. Right. And, you know, but he had to somehow organize himself to be able to give it and to and to enjoy it. Yeah. And, to, you know, I, was, I mean, I don't know. It, it, it's funny, you know, because, you know, it's easy to help people who are deserving. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's harder when you're helping them when they're, it's just need, right. you know. Hmm. Thank you. Hey, you've said this once. I can't remember where I I didn't do good note taking, but you said art itself, like psychoanalysis, psycho analysis, analysis yeah. sorry, comes from deep inside you. Somewhere all of these things are roiling around, coming together and falling apart. But that's not my question. That's just that's your quote. Yeah. You get up every morning and dance with the coming together, the roiling around, the falling apart. You sit up on the side of the bed and then you aim yourself to whatever desk or chair you are closest to at home, hotel. Maybe one of these uh, things that we're talking about in that quote, whenever we discuss Walter Mosley, how do you separate those things? How do those things, when you get up every day and do something, how does it not become rote? How do you keep the creativity in it? How do you look for the imaginative line that is going to meet you there at the desk in that chair 
I don't know. Mm -hmm. You you have written 60 books in 35 years. Mm -hmm. That's true. I, I don't expect you to tell me the process, but you got to tell me something. <laughs> that sounds like a Richard Pryor joke I heard once. Uh, you know, I, well, you know, I mean, the 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 the, the uh, comparison, the the metaphor, the the you know of it would be this. You know, you have a child, and every every morning the child gets up, and the child is different every morning, every morning. Like you know, uh, and a, a week goes by, and they're they're really different, and you don't even want to go away for two or three days because you know you don't know what you're going to find. I was sitting with a friend of mine the other day. So much, and it's so good. But 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 you know, it's like you know, it's not rote. No, it's not. It's not rote. I, I was you know, talking to a friend. Getting up is, but not anything after that. Yeah, yeah. Getting up is, you know, it's just and and who knows where you're going to be when you get up for that matter. But <laughs> I, I was talking to a friend the other day. She was she she had just seen her nieces, uh, and. And then she's just like six months before, and she got a picture, and one of the nieces was six inches taller. You know, so her father's very tall, and, and usually she was like up to the father's hip, but all of a sudden she's up to his shoulder. Wow. You know, and when and, did that happen? Yeah, right. and it's just like, oh my god, you know, like what what happened? But it, it's it's like that. It's much more a living thing. I think mm. that that the writing mm. itself, and it's not true for all writers. You know, I no. mean, but but you know that. You know, when you're when you're working on something, it's it's changing while you're changing. Yes. You know, and it's because of you, and it's because of it, and it's because of the world that 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 we're surrounded by. Yeah. That uh, that things move and change. So it, it it's never wrote. Right. It, it, it you know, and if you know, that's is kind of like a pun, right? With W R O, but but we won't work. We won't work that. Uh, but Thank but you. but but it, but it's 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 that it's that thing you know that that you because every day you go to you write for a little while and then you go to sleep and in the back of your brain that what they call that dinosaur brain all these things that have ever happened are saying what's that what's that okay I, I no I want it I want it no what what's that you know and then the next day you you wake up and there's the, all these new ideas there and it's it's amazing you know. You were the one of the first writers who I ever listened to. You didn't say that. You said something else. Talk about the getting up and going to the desk mm -hmm. every morning. Every. Yeah, every day. Every. And of course, you know, some days you're sick and, you know, but every is the, is the word that I latch on to. Yeah. Not when you feel like it. Not when you have an idea. Not when you're inspired. None of those things. And it wasn't. And, and you just confirm for me yes it's work yes writing is work full stop but when you when the analysis and when the analogy is like a child and you see the inches growing that's mm -hmm. like more pages that you have mm -hmm. for the project yeah. that's the same kind of that's the metaphor that i see mm -hmm. and that's what you want as a writer you want the pages to be there by friday <laughs> And 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 continue that you know the the thing about the the child after after a while and not after a long while the child is teaching you you said uh, don't uh, yeah we we went over there I said no daddy we didn't go there don't you remember you know there's a woman and with the nice dress on and you said how nice she no uh, uh, uh. I did not say that and. You know, but but you know, it's the that's the roiling around and the coming together and yeah, the falling right. apart. And you're saying, I wish, I wish that my son wouldn't pay so much attention to what I do. <laughs> you know, you authored a book in 2007 entitled "This Year You Write Your Novel." Mm, yeah, it's one of the most important books for anyone who is thinking about writing. A novel and does not know how to get started or what to do next. It is a small, thin rocket of a book. You sent it to me in 2007. I have given it away at least 15 times. And every time I tell the person, I want my book back, I never get it back. No. I love this book. 
It's so unpretentious. It's so encouraging. Do you remember when you thought about what, writing the book itself, what you wanted to do, how it came to you? Was it one of those mornings when you were just at the desk or, or was it more than that? Well, I think the idea developed, I, you know, I've been to you know, things like this, I you know, do a reading and, and then people ask you questions and, and, and it, it really, it was so frustrating. It's like tantalizing, tantalizingly frustrating. Mm -hmm. Like a person will, 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 would ask me say, well, okay, Mr. Moore, say, how do you, but how do you go about writing the novel? Right. right. And I, and I, and I look at him, I think if I only had 45 minutes, I could, ex mm -hmm. I could answer that question, mm -hmm. but I only have four minutes. And so one day I just said, I'm going to write this book. Hopefully somebody will publish it. Mm -hmm. And then whenever anybody asks, I said, well, just, you know, go get, get the book, you know, and, 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 and read it, you know. Right. And I hate it, you know, because so many people write books about writing that are longer than the book you're going to write. <laughs> and you're going, what are you talking about? And they're talking about Shakespeare and they're talking about, you know, uh, James Baldwin. And, and you say, man, I don't need to be James Baldwin. I just would like to tell the story. You know, right here, right. Uh, and 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 so you know that was my that was where I came from in writing it. Mm, yeah, mm. it's a great book. Well, thank you, yeah, thank you. It I really appreciate is. it. The black male hero figure. You didn't just illuminate. You don't just illuminate a black male protagonist. Another of your legacies is your dedication to the black male hero mm -hmm. figure. And I love, I, I want to read something that Langston Hughes said in his 1941 Crisis Magazine essay called The Need for Heroes, because it deeply ties into what I feel you are doing to this day. Hughes said, look around you for the living heroes who may not speak perfect English, who are your neighbors, who are courageous, straightforward, strong whose words and thoughts gather up in our own hearts and say it clearly and plainly, sitting quietly in a chair in front of you. Mm -hmm. That's Easy Rollins. Mm -hmm. 1990 through 2021. And Fearless Jones, 2001 through 2006. That's Leonid McGill, 2009 through 2020. And now King Oliver and down the river unto the sea, 2018, and Every Man a King, 2023. Does Hughes' call for heroes call to you? Well, I, I didn't know about, about the essay. So, he, But, of course, in two ways. Number one, he was looking at the same, the same world I was looking at. There are a lot of great writers. You know, there, there's Wright, you know, and there's Ellison. Uh, Himes, even there's, I mean, there, I mean, Himes is closer to the hero thing, but there's still some issues there. But, but the thing is, is what, what you would see when you'd read it, even if you weren't thinking it, is these people are, uh, in many ways victims. Mm. You know, in, in many ways, these characters are victims, mm. and they're and 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 in through that victim movement, we'll talking about their lives, mm. what happened, and you have black readers reading it and go, "Yeah, well, I see that, I understand it." Mm. Uh, you didn't do that, but uh, and 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 the thing is, you know, it, and that's true. There are a lot of people like that, but you know, when Easy comes to, you know, he's look, he's sitting there and he's looking at the ground, he's all sad, and Ma say, "Hey, man, what's wrong?" So well, you know, the, the tax man is after me. And you know, I kinda I kinda cheated on my tax. <laughs> he said, Well, sh shit, man, uh, that's all right. I go I go to burn down the the he said, I tell you what, I killed the dude. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 then and easy says, you know, because this is logic. I mean, we're talking we're talking logic here. So he said, Well, you know, my stuff's not gonna work because you know, they just get another guy. <laughs> And he said, well, I killed him too. And then I burned down the courthouse. You know, and the thing you love about Miles is he's not scared of anything. And that's why you want heroes. Right. The hero is not afraid. Right. You know, uh, when, when Fearless Jones looks at his friend Paris Menton and Paris said, wow, you're so brave. He said, man, I'm not brave. You brave because you with me. He right. said, I'm not brave. Nothing scares me. 
you know, you do you do this stuff even though you're scared, and so even, so we can become a part of it. And and I think it's it's so important, and it's so important about black male heroes because you know, really, there are a lot of extraordinary black women writers who write about black female heroes. Right. I mean, there are. You right. know, and there's Alice Walker and Toni Morrison, but you know, and but I mean, like that's just the the, the top of it. There's there's a hundred that I could name, you know, in time, you know, and. I, I'm like I, I just want to be there doing it too. Yeah. But you, your your writings, you started publishing when you were thirty four, no thirty eight, thirty eight. 38? Yeah, yeah. So I think that was around the same time that Morrison and Alice Walker and Terry McMillan, mm-hmm. those books were coming out into the world as well. They were like like six years before, six years seven before? years ago, okay before. That that you know was starting, okay. and it was so many of them. Yes, you know, and of course there was the white feminist movement, right? Which right. said, hey, well, if you know, all you you know, that, and that thing in a in Jesus Christ Superstar where where Simon says to Jesus, uh, keep you know, keep them yelling their devotion, mm. but add a touch of hate at Rome. Mm. We will rise to a greater power, mm. uh, and, and we will find ourselves a home. Mm. You know, there's that there was that. That's what. Uh, n- not only, but that's a lot of what white feminism had had said to, to these black women. So it was very supportive mm, of them. Mm. You know, nobody really wanted to hear about black male heroes. You know, that was a problem. You know, it's like, you well, know. How was that to write into and to keep, I mean, you were still getting up every morning writing. I yeah. mean, yeah. Well, because I love writing. Uh, best part of writing is writing. I tell you what happened. It's like a lot of people said, you know, in the beginning, 80% of my black audiences was women. They would come in and they buy the book and they give it to their boyfriend, but, mm. and he'd say he would read it. But <laughs> uh, and and I, you know, sometimes when black men were walking into my room and said, "What are you looking for the video department?" Because, <laughs> uh, uh, but but the thing was, is as time went by, yeah, because uh, black men just wanted to hear the truth. They didn't want to hear. They didn't want to hear a lie. They didn't want to hear. You know, they didn't yeah. want to see James. You know, uh, John Wayne, black man hero. You right. know, and 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 and. And, and after a while, you know, I, I'd begun to convince people that, hey, the, these are characters that I can identify with. Right. You know, they read about Mouse. They know Mouse. Right. You know, right. It's, I, I know that man. Right. You know, I stay out of his way, but I know <laughs> him. You know. I want to talk a little bit about um, telling the truth hmm. in your, especially for me, your political monographs. I, I I love them and I need them. I need to know that you can write about Easy Rollins. And I also need to know that you want also to write a, about and to name such things as, I love these, working on the chain gang, shaking off the dead hand of history, 2000, life out of context, which includes a proposal for the nonviolent takeover of the House of Representatives, 2006. Brilliant. And way before it's time, what next? An African American initiative toward world peace, two thousand and three, right? Yeah, it, it, it came out the, the day we attacked uh, uh, Iraq. Yeah. How you 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 write every genre under the sun? You write mystery. You write writing guides. You write science fiction. You write graphic novels. You write comics. I love I love what you say about comics and how you were you know you read them in your early days and how much they mattered to you. Erotica plays and recently on uh, last 10 years or so you have been doing a lot of writing for television. Mm. The show Snowfall, mm. Apple TV's limited series The Last Days of Ptolemy Gray yeah. based on your 2010 novel starring yeah. Samuel Jackson. Yeah. A fairy tale, so so good about an old man navigating dementia. Mm. Yeah, I was very proud of it. I mean, it's a hard, that's a hard story to get on television. <laughs> and, you know, luckily I had Sam, you know, and Sam, Sam said, oh, not because a lot of people in his family had dementia and Alzheimer's and he really wanted to do it. You know, he's such a great actor. And, and you know, he, he understood the book and that was really fun. It was really nice to be able to say, because, you know, most times, you know, you need, well, who got killed? How did they do it? You know, right, right, right. Well, you know, somebody got killed, but it doesn't, it's not, that's not what's important. You know. At what point along this 30 year plus career do you just write? You don't have to make the decision to what you're gonna write about. You just do you just pull the next roiling thought forward and 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 you don't have to so many writers stay in a narrow box. 
They mm -hmm. just write fiction. They just write poetry. I've always hated that. I've always thought I do. I don't. I I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. I love words. Right. I exactly. love you. You love the story. You know. Well, you know, I, it's so interesting. Just the the one thing, I, I, and I've said in these books, so I know you've seen it. That you know, whenever I write about writing, I have two books about writing. You know, uh, aspect uh, a, a, aspects of the novel, and also uh, this year you write your novel. Uh, uh, no, element. Excuse me. Elements, elements of, fiction, of fiction. Elements of fiction. And uh, this year you, you write your novel. Uh, in, in both of them, I, I say, if you want to be able to write fiction, you have to learn how to write poetry. Yes. You don't have to be a poet. You don't have to be a good poet. You know. You you just have to understand what poets do. Mm. You have to understand how about you know uh, shrinking down language. You have to understand about a metaphor, the difference between a metaphor and a simile. You have to understand that there's music in language. That's that's where language comes out of music, and that and that and that you have to 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 equate that music. You have to learn how people talk, mm. what people say, mm. how they say it. Mm. Uh, you 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 uh, you have to learn all of that stuff, and I and I learn all of that from poetry. Mm. And I think that the thing is, is you know, and we we learn from television. And right. we learn. I was, oh God, I was in, I was in um, Atlanta, uh, and it was me and a few other writers. And there was this young woman who was taking us around. This young black woman taking us around, and she was gorgeous. It, she was gorgeous. She's walking, and she's walking us down the street. You know, un, you know, un, kind of unconsciously gorgeous. And there's these three guys standing on the corner, telling stories, drinking wine. And we walk by, and one of the guys said, "Oh my God." He said, girl, you got to stop. <laughs> and, you know, you, really, it's poetry, right? Right, 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 right. Because right. <laughs> either you got to stop looking like that. <laughs> right, right, right. Or you got to stop and talk to us. <laughs> and she just went, mm. and just walked on, you know, and it was, it was, but it was so, it, it was, but like you learn from everything, yeah, right? Yeah. Like everything in, in your, your, your life, you know, and, and that's a lot of, you know, a lot of people in, you know, our kind of business, right. they spend all of their times with writers, with writing, with books, right. with, you know, and it's, it, and it's like, okay, you say, you don't write books about books. Right. <laughs> like you going to write me a book about a man writing a book. No, I, I don't want to hear that. You know, that's, that's not interesting. Right. You know? Yeah. So my last question, is it? I think so. And then we're going to open it up to the audience a little uh -huh. bit more. Your newest book, Every Man a King, was on the cover of the New York Times book review section? Yeah, it was. I'm like, I'm, I, I'm making coffee in the morning. I've just pulled my New York Times into the house. <laughs> I'm like, this is new. Yeah, I've never seen Walter on the cover. He should have been on the cover, but how was that? Um, well, you know, I mean, it's it's great having been writing so long because my answer is, oh, it was fine. You know, it was good. I was I was glad about it. You know, that that time with Gwendolyn when she got the the yeah. National Book Award, yes. it's a it was a complex thing. It was me and Gwendolyn and also Haki Madabuti, yes. the yes. most you know important unknown black man in America, and and like. And, and, you know, and, you know, hockey is very serious. Yes. And, you know, and I'm, as you can tell, silly, you know. <laughs> and so it took him a long time to understand. But when, when, when Gwendolyn was there, Gwendolyn turned to him and she said, now, you know, they talk about black men and, uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 and they say that, you know, they don't support women and they're against women. But this black man here got me. Now, I'm expecting her to say, got here that award. Mm -hmm. so, this black man here, he got me $10,000. <laughs> Did she say that? Uh-huh. I was like, it was so great. I was like, right. That's what it, 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 and really, and I knew she meant it. I mean, it was like, yeah, oh, yeah, those, those people got their awards and they're okay and that's all right. Right, but, right, but... <laughs> Ten thousand dollars. That's I can pay me some rent with that. Right. And I just, I just, it, it's just that kind of wonderful thing, you know. When you become, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. You know, I was on the cover. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, and I'm, and I'm happy because it gives me purchase and gives me ability to do things. Right. And, and, and but, but the idea, you know, the idea that. Uh, 
the recognition is someplace else. You mm. know, the recognition is in this room. Mm. The recognition mm. is, you know, when, mm-hmm. when, uh, you know, when, uh, when I'm, I talked to, I was talking to Paul Coates, his son, Tanahasi, uh, had a friend in Paris and, and, and the friend was leaving the department in Paris for, um, for, you know, a little while. Yeah. And, but you know, they had a cat. And so, uh, Paul said, "I'll go take care of your cat, and me and my wife will live in your in your apartment uh, while we do it in Paris, and and which is cool, you know." And I thought, "Wow, that's a great idea." I was talking to him, and I said, "Wow, Paul, that's great." I said, "Man, I should come see you," and he said, "Yeah, come see me. Come on out." And and I did, and I, and that mm. to me is so much more important. Yeah, 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 yeah. Than being on the cover, you know, because you know, I mean. Those things are those things are transitory. Right. You know? I understand what you're saying. I uh, like it though. Yeah. It's, it's I, transitory. Yeah. I, yes. It, there's so many stories that could attach to that. You know, Morrison's life, mm-hmm. um, the awards she didn't win, should have won, didn't wait for, all those kinds of things. Yeah. Right. Um, and Tony was so wonderful. You know, the, the thing about Tony, you know, she was t- in in public. Tony had that sound you know <laughs> well uh that is what you call literature you know and you just look at it and go wow man we were just talking about chitlins backstage <laughs> it's called the switcheroo <laughs> you are so good in her film the oh, tony yeah. morrison yeah. film which is called help me i what I was it yes a piece of me, a piece of pieces of me, something like that. Pieces of me, some pieces of me. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah, it's wonderful. So, every man a king, newest book out, twenty twenty three. Joe King Oliver, a police investigator who turns and um, becomes a PI. Right. This is a twist in to me uh, in your in your sort of registry. Absolutely. I never write about police. You never so. write about police. You know, it's yeah. like, whoa, what's going on here? Um, you, you, your, your folks want to have nothing to do with the police. And we find him seeking justice for a white nationalist who is imprisoned at Rikers. Yeah. You write a lot about uh, guilt and innocence in your books. This, the, so the plot line is surprising, but not the subject matter. Why is this particular story so important in the pantheon of other Walter Mosley guilt and innocence stories? I, I, two things, and 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 right, because there's actually another book after that that I want to mention. Um, but um, it, it, I haven't. It, you think if you think long enough on something, one of the things is about truth. Yeah. If somebody tells you the truth, and you know, wow, that's true, then you have to do something. Right. Like, you know, somebody says something, you go, I wonder about that. You don't have to do anything. But if it's true, when, when you know, when Max Rodriguez told me, he said, Walter, you're, you're very successful. Uh, you, you need to give a book to a black publisher. I went, yeah, that's right. Because if when I give it to a white publisher, I get 15 percent of it. But a black publisher, I get 15 percent and black people get the other 85 percent. I mean, that, that that's that's actually a no brainer, you know, and 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 and, and that uh, that's that's the thing. One of the things that I've really begun to understand lately, uh, and that you know that we should always know. Here, well, here's the story. Uh, Harry Belafonte, great friend of Martin Luther King Jr. Great friend of Martin Luther King Jr. He looked to, at him like he was a god. It's interesting because Martin Luther King Jr. looked at Harry like that mm. because Harry had what he, Martin wanted. Mm. Harry had everybody loved him. Harry walk out on the stage and say, "Dale." <laughs> And there, there's not a person in the in in the audience, black, white, Asian. Yeah, you know, they they all love him, and and Martin wanted he wanted to get he wanted that connection. Mm. Anyway, he was talking to 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 Harry. He used to stay in his house in New York, and uh, and and one day he was talking to him, and he said, um, he said, you know, uh, Harry, I've been thinking lately that we might be integrating into. A burning house. Mm, mm, mm. And, and Harry went, "Oh, well. Uh, so, what do you think we should we we should do about that?" And he looked at him and he says, "We have to become firemen." Yes. And I think that that 
is what I'm, I'm like, like getting at. I'm, I look at all of these, you know, it used to be that white America had a leg or two up on black America. They just did, you know, well, who, oh, oh, you get this first. Well, you get the loan Well, you get the house Well, you can live where you want. Well, you, you know, all of that stuff. But, you know, capitalism and, and, and its uh, infinite uh, intelligence just took all that away. Mm. And so now we're saying, OK, you know, listen, guys, we guys, we can work together on this. Mm -hmm. We don't have to like each other. We don't have to marry each other. We don't have to live next to each other. We can call each other all kinds of names. But we need. But there's a 500 pound weight. I I can lift 250. You can lift 250. What's the answer? Mm. You know. And the answer is simple. So okay, let's move it. Sure. You know. And um. And that's what I've been wanting to to start to write about. Mm. You know, which is why he 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 goes. At, you know, he 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 tries to to prove that this man is actually innocent of the crimes that he's being uh, blamed for. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, and then the next book uh, is a book called Touch. It just came out, mm. uh, and it, it's a science fiction book about um, uh, about uh, beings at the very beginning of, of the of the you know the Big Bang who who ha have come from the last uh, iteration, and they're saying the greatest threat to the universe is the chromosome. Mm. That molecule is the greatest threat to the universe. We got to do something about it. Mm. And so, they, and one of the the the, the hundred and seven uh, people that they that they anoint in, in in this world today is this black man. And the and the black man is he has to you know he he's doing his thing, trying to help you know, trying to do some right, uh, fighting this other guy who just represents death. He said, "I just want to kill everybody," mm. you know. And 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 he and he deals with these these um, these uh, you know these these white supremacists, you know, and they learn how to work together. Not necessarily how to like each other, right? But learn right. how to work together, right? You know, and, and this is you know for me this is everything. You know, this is everything that, that you know we have to work together. We have to look at the world. We have to look at uh, Ghana. I, I, I mean, I, I assume some of you have been to, to Ghana. Mm -hmm. Ghana is one of the richest goddamn countries in the world. And the people are as poor as they can be. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's I mean, it's kind of white people taking that stuff, but there's a lot of black people taking that stuff too. Mm -hmm. You know, they they got you know eighty percent of the chocolate of the world come out of Ghana. And you have fifty billion dollar business. And, and, and the people who run the farms can barely feed themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 so there, there's a thing that we all, you know, we have to work together in, in that kind of way that's going to make sure that everybody is taken care of. And we can't just say, well, we're going to we make sure this is for black people. Right. Because if anybody's not getting it, everybody's not getting it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what I've been yes, you know, right, right about. Yeah. Right. Thank you. <laughs> we're going to uh, open this up. We hope you have some questions. Uh, for Walter Mosley, I think there, I think there are some microphones in the audience somewhere. There's a hand right there. I see that. See that hand? Okay. It, it's it's some hand there. Hi. Hi. I've just finished. Uh, I actually have two quick questions, if I may. The first, I just finished touched and. Uh, you know, it's totally different from anything I've read by you uh, already. But uh, I feel it's uh, leading to a sequel, and I wonder if that's already in the uh, process. It's in my head. I, I, I'm not <laughs> writing it. Right I thought now. so. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, I can see that coming. My other question is about mouse. I, you know, one of the most fascinating, and I've got to say, Easy Rollins is my favorite protagonist. I think ever, you know, Thank just you. I love Easy Rollins. I mean, the whole thing. I uh, taught in middle school for a few years, and I was good friends with a Miss, Mr. Washington, who was a maintenance man there, and so I could identify with Easy really easy. <laughs> but my my question is, Mouse, uh, you know. Is this someone you knew or a combination of a whole bunch of people that have passed through your life? Uh, I, I, I'll answer that question in, in, in two, two sections. First is, yes, this guy, uh, that, that guy was a friend of my father's. And he was the guy that my father used to talk about. With the guy used to go out and he used to hijack liquor trucks. <laughs> and he would come to my, my father's house with a, you know, with a crate of you know, 12 quarts of whiskey. 
And he said, hey, Roy, I just got this. Uh, hold on to it for me, will you? And my father would you know, put it somewhere. And then the guy would come back a week later and say, well, okay, how much you owe me? Because he knows he's going to be drinking it. He ain't going to have a party. You know? And he said, well, I drank three bottles. He said, okay, that'd be, that'd be uh, $15. I'll take it right now. Uh, and and he, he went to prison uh, because... He was he was uh, you know shooting craps in the back of a barber shop, and uh, he told the guy he owed him a dime. The guy said he didn't owe him a guy dime, so the guy he so he killed him. He killed him. He said, well, you, well okay, you're not gonna pay me, but you're gonna die. And he <laughs> and he shot him, and he went to prison. He still, you know he, he died in prison, you know. But you know one, one of the things that I really like, I'm, I'm, I'm you know in the new book, I'm, I just finished the new Easy Rollins novel. It's out there waiting, you know. I think coming out in June. Um, but w- one of the things is is that it, it started in the last book, but uh, Mouse has a new girlfriend. He's moved on from Edame, and he has he has a new girlfriend, and she's Vietnamese. But she's not just Vietnamese; she was Viet Cong. And you know, it's it's the perfect right girlfriend for Mouse. It, it's like, and and because it, you know, sometimes you know, when you're writing about characters, you might be able to te- you know, you might r- write into their character. They do this, they do that, they say this, but. If you write what they what they do what they do what they what, what who they're with that 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 actually enhances them you know and because you know that and his girlfriend man she's she's just as bad as he is you know it's like mm. thank you you're welcome hello mr mosley thank you for everything i've loved your writing i'm telling you you're wonderful but I have a, a problem, an issue. When are you going to do another 47? Oh, yeah, the, the extension of 47, I haven't gotten there yet. I, w- I would like to, you know, it's interesting because the publisher, I, yeah, I came back to them. I said, you want me to write another one? And they said, no, we're not interested. Oh, no. You know? And, you know, then they started coming back. But the book is still, so, it sells a lot, you know. Oh, yeah. Haki, you know, who runs four schools in Chicago, he, like, you know, he buys a, a few hundred of them every year anyway, right. you know, but but uh, they asked me to, to write, could you write a new introduction? I said, no, I could write a new book. I write a new book or nothing. You know, but I will do it one day. I, I, I will. But not, not quite yet. And, okay. and thank you for that. No, thank you. But in, in not only the book is phenomenal, but the Audible with Ossie Davis, mm-hmm. reading it is just phenomenal as well. So thank you for both of those. Yeah, Ossie is a great man. Good evening. Hello. Your falling out with the group. The, you're falling out with the group in in New York where mm-hmm. they had hired you and they didn't want you to say the N I G G E R word. You mean nigger? Right, 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 right. And 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 the person who hired you, you didn't even say anything. You just quit. Yeah. And then you wrote the op-ed uh, article. I would like to hear what you wrote in that op-ed article because I've been trying to find it, and I oh, can't New York Times it. has it. Just look up New York Times; you can find it. You know, they 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 keep all that stuff. So you know, New York Times, you know that article. But but the thing was is that you know, I mean, you know, it it, it was so it, it was such an interesting thing. You know, people say you know you have to say the N word, but you know, the N word doesn't insult anybody. And, you know, and so you can say, well, N word, N word, you know, you, it, it's ridiculous, you know. And you say, nigga, you got to, you got to, you have to pay for that, you know. It's a, you know, it's a, that, that's a, that, you know, that was a whole thing, you know. And, and, and that's why, and, and also, listen, if I called somebody a name, you know, if I could go up to somebody and say, you bastard, you know, well, that's aggressive. But if I, if I go up to somebody and say, well, this other guy called me a bastard. Now, that's not aggressive at all. I'm just telling them words and language that exist in the dictionary, you know. And on top of that, I was called to HR, not because the people cared. It, they just didn't want to get sued, you know. And, and so the whole idea of freedom of speech becomes a, a, a subset of some kind of legal argument. You know, but but you the New York it's New York Times. It was in New York Times, and so you, they have it. You you'll be able to find it. Are you familiar with Lenny Bruce's? Uh, yeah. Comedy bit on that. Yeah. Absolutely. And Lenny Bruce, yeah, Lenny Bruce today. Well, Chris, they 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 they, they canceled him back then. <laughs> they came and arrested him. Uh, like they come in and arrest him. 
It would be amazing. That would have been funny if they got arrested. I got arrested. They said, Mr. Police are here, Mr. Mosley. How you doing, sir? Yeah. Right. Yep. I got two questions for you. Okay. One, this is my daughter, Akila. And, and she has some flowers for you. Aww. Okay. Sweet. I'll get, I'll get, yo, yeah. Hi, Akila. Wow. And my second question is, um, I want to, I want to, find, <laughs> uh, when you was writing the story about uh, Easy and Ethelmay, like you said, Easy, who is Mouse's friend, but Easy wound up going to bed with his wife. Then his his uh of course it, Mouse didn't find out, but then Mouse wound up making love to his wife, and then uh, Easy was listening. I was wondering what you was like. How you was thinking? How you put that together? <laughs> uh, what's that? How about how you put that together? You know. You know, she, she made a creative thought process. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, I mean, you know, we, we've all heard things. <laughs> so what is that? Is that an animal out in the woods? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, no, well, you know, uh, most by the by did know. He knew. Uh, it, but he didn't care because he said, you know, nobody can make the, love to my wife like I can. So, you know, that's all right. That's just, you know. But it, it it was it was kind of you know fun you know because I mean that's the thing, M Mouse is you know is, is is the the absolute you know quintessence of masculinity so you know and everybody wants to be Mouse you know that's great I want to be shorter and skinnier you know and Mouse. Hey, yep. how you doing? I'm My fine. name is Johnny Lee Crockett. I'm from Daytona Beach, Florida, and you took me through the chain gang. Because you and Miles and everything that would happen within my life that you transition me through out of things. Mm -hmm. But my question is before I get fired from work, did you ever meet Donald Goins? Did I ever meet who? Donald Goins. Donald Goins. Yeah, you know Donald Goins. Yeah, Donald Goins. No, I never met Donald Goins. Never, never. I mean, you know, I've seen films on him and yeah, I've read all not maybe not all, but most of his books. But I haven't, you know. I did when I when I when I received the um, the medal for the for the you know from the National Book Award, I I I I I said I said look there's all these people there's Ishmael Reed you know there's Donald Goins there are all these major writers who you could have given this award to, you know I'm glad you gave it to me I was I wasn't giving it back but I, you know, you know, Donald, you know, Goins, is a ma he's a major writer. You know, he, he was a major writer of American, the, of the American experience, even beyond American history, the American experience. And, you know, nobody wanted to, you know, it's like, it's like Sonny Liston. Thank uh, you. We have three questions lined up for you, and that'll be the last three. Okay. Hi. Um, thank you so much. This has been incredible, Mr. Mosley. Um, my question is, your characters are incredibly rich and complex. Do, do you create them or do they show up? <sighs> you know, it, it's such a hard question to answer because, you know, I was, when, when I, was, I was at Howard recently talking to some, you know, writing students and, and, you know, there's a young, young man was saying, well, I have the beginning, I have the middle, and I have the end, but I can't get them all together, you know? And I said, well, that makes sense. And he says, what do you mean? I said, a novel is bigger than your head. A novel is a giant thing. A character is just as big as any novel. You, 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 you just keep working at it and working at it, try, trying to, to bring it out. Uh, it's the character it's it's you, um, but it's not. I I don't own it in a, in a complete sense. It's not like writing an essay, uh, and 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 because and so I mean I hope that's a good enough answer because it's all the answer I have, 
you know, but it, 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 it's like, yeah, the character comes to me. Yes, I create the character, but that's a small part of it. Yep. Uh, what advice do you have for young writers? Well, I mean, that, 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 that's a simple. And, and are you a young writer? Yes. <laughs> and what are you writing? Uh, well, I don't really write all the time, but, like, occasionally I like to write. Like, sometimes I just, like, sometimes it's, like, hard to think of things to write about. So. Well, you know, it, 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 so I'll give you advice rather than young writers in general. <laughs> um, you know, write when you want to write. That's the first thing. But if if what you want is to finish a story come up with a character or a couple of characters who have a maybe an agreement or a disagreement or an adventure that they're going to be on and write about it on a Monday, you know, maybe you know, spend a half an hour, hour, something like that, writing about it. And then the next day, read what you wrote yesterday and then write some more. And then the next day, read what you wrote yesterday and write some more. And just keep on going. And when you get to the end of the story, that's the beginning of you writing that story. Because when you get to the end, then you read the whole thing and you see, what was I saying here? And that, and that will reveal itself to you. And as you rewrite it, then the story really comes into, into life. Okay, this will be our last question. And then I'll just ask everybody real quick. Uh, we're going to let Mr. Mosley uh, get to the signing line, and everybody will just line up outside. But if you'll just let him get there, that'll make it even for everybody, okay? Um, all right, last question. Mr. Mosley, I want to also thank you for all your work. Uh, I stumbled across your work uh, when with Black Betty, mm. and uh, kind of worked my way back, and then I've been pre-ordering everything since then. Um, like everyone, I have a fascination with Mouse, and uh, I remember seeing an interview that uh, Denzel did after the movie came out, and he said he picked the wrong role. <laughs> <laughs> you also call some names that 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 also uh, mean a lot to me. Uh, Haki Matabuti, I've been reading since he was Donnell Lee. Yeah, and uh, he actually, along with uh, Stokely Carmichael, actually awakened me. And I'd like to ask you to please tell Paul Coates that uh, Bernie Gallman said hello. You got it. All right. So thank you, everybody. Um, thank you to Mr. Mosley, and, and thank you to Dr. Nikki Finney. All right, uh, we will, like I said, there is the bar still, and there is some food in the gallery space, so please help yourself. Um